move to our, our next speaker, and that's Dr. David Spiegel from Stanford University. He'll be presenting virtually, discussing hypnosis and mindfulness. Dr. Spiegel. Uh, thank you very much. Can you see my, uh, my title slide here? Um, yes, we can. Good, okay. Um, well, the message from this previous excellent talk and mine is um, that the strain and pain lies mainly in the brain. And there are ways in integrative oncology that we have learned to help people substantially with problems like pain and anxiety using their, their brains and uh, systems uh, like those um, activated with acupuncture that can control the way people experience pain and substantially uh, help people reduce it. Um, I have a disclosure. I'm co-founder of Reverie Health. It's a digital interactive hypnosis app. Uh, SABCS has approved my discussing this with you. It's a free app, uh, and I'll discuss how we're trying to make techniques like hypnosis much more widely available than they've been in the past. So I'll discuss what hypnosis is, what we know about the neurobiology of it, how it can be used for stress and pain management. We'll have a little self-hypnosis experience for those who would like to try it. Um, we'll talk about how it's used with the app and then talk about mindfulness as well. Uh, you can, this is uh, Bode Miller getting ready to um, uh, ski in the Sochi Olympics. And uh, there was very little snow at that Olympics. So the competitors were only allowed to do one practice run. So what Bode and other of the American team did was they went up to the top of the thing and they looked up, closed their eyes and imagined the run, every move in the run. Um, and they did extremely well. Hypnosis can be a powerful way of narrowing the focus of attention the way he was doing, allowing you to better connect mind and body and control what's going on in your body. There are three main components. Absorption, getting so tightly absorbed uh, the way you would in a movie or a play that you're really enjoying or reading a novel, that you put aside other thoughts. You reduce activity in parts of the brain, the salience network that are telling you to worry about something else. You dissociate, you separate your focal attention from what's going on elsewhere in your bodies. Right now, if you're sitting, you have sensations in your bottoms touching the chairs. Hopefully at this point, you weren't paying attention to that. Our brains are very good at doing that and that's a great therapeutic tool. And there is what people worry about with hypnosis is suggestibility. Can someone control you and take over everything you do? Hypnosis is really a way of enhancing your own self-control. It's not a way of losing control. We've been studying hypnosis in the brain, and what we find when people go into a state of hypnosis is they turn down activity in the anterior cingulate gyrus here. This is a part of what we call the salience network that tells you what to pay attention to and what to ignore. And when you turn down activity, you're less likely to be distracted by other input. And so it's a powerful way of enhancing the intensity of your focal attention. In addition, two other things happen. There's uh, heightened functional connectivity between the executive control region, the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex, and the insula, which is a major mind-body pathway. So it's a way, it's also part of the pain network. So it's a way of enhancing your control over your perception of things like pain and your ability to control functions in the body. The third thing that happens, and this will come up at the end of my talk, is inverse connectivity between the executive control network and the, the uh, default mode network, the posterior cingulate cortex in particular. Activity there is also reduced in, in mindfulness. So you disconnect what you're doing from what it means that you're doing it. It gives people a certain kind of freedom that we call dissociation um, from uh, worrying about the consequences of what you're doing. And one of the ways that hypnosis works very powerfully is that it's your own internal um, uh, benzodiazepine. There is a relationship between the intensity of your ability to experience hypnosis and uh, the availability of um, GABA aminobutyric acid, GABA receptors in the brain. Um, and so in a sense, you can activate your own anti-anxiety pharmacology just by going into a hypnotic state. One of the things we also know is not everybody's equally hypnotizable. Most children, most eight-year-olds are in hypnotic states most of the time, as you know, if you try to call them in for dinner while they're playing. Um, but in, in adult life, we, we reach a fairly stable degree of hypnotizability that's about as stable as our IQ over a 25-year interval. 
and about two thirds of the adult population are hypnotizable. About 15% are very hypnotizable. So your ability to use it is greater if you are more hypnotizable. And that's related to functional connectivity between the executive control network and the anterior cingulate, the conflict management or salience network. So people who can coordinate activity there can make even greater use of hypnotic analgesia. And it's also correlated with the levels of dopamine in the cerebrospinal fluid. Dopamine is, is a major neurotransmitter, particularly in the frontal cortex. And so it's related also to hypnotic activity. So hypnosis helps you to better mobilize naturally occurring neurotransmitter systems in the brain. How do we use it? We uh, use techniques for anxiety, like teaching people to float. Um, there's a lot we can't do about stressors we face, but we can do something about how our bodies react to them. We, are, we evolve to react to stress mostly physiologically, to fight or flee. But most of our stressors now are not, fight or, are not responsive to fighting or fleeing. And so being able to control your body by imagining you're floating somewhere safe and comfortable can be a way to help you better manage anxiety. We can alter sensation, uh, substitute a sense of warmth or coolness, tingling or numbness uh, where people have pain and substantially reduce pain. So if you'd like to get a taste of what hypnosis is like, let's do this little exercise. If you don't want to, that's just fine. So get as comfortable as you can. On one, do one thing, look up to the top of your head. Two, do two things, slowly close your eyes and take a deep breath. Hold your breath and then slowly exhale. And on three, do three things. Let the breath all the way out. Let your eyes relax, but keep them closed and let your body float. Please imagine you're floating in a bath, a lake, a hot tub, or just floating in space. And notice how quickly and easily you can use your store of memories and your imagination to help yourself and your body feel better. If you happen to have any discomfort right now, imagine that that part of your body is warmer or cooler or tingling and try to filter the hurt out of the pain. Now, please picture in your mind's eye an imaginary screen. It could be a movie screen or a TV screen or a piece of clear blue sky. Picture a pleasant scene somewhere you enjoy being, where you naturally feel good. And again, notice how you can use your store of memories to help yourself and your body feel better. Now, if something is bothering you right now, pick one thing. Divide the screen in half and picture that thing on the left, but with the rule that no matter what you see on the screen, you're keeping your body floating and comfortable. Notice how you can picture something, even something upsetting, without your body reacting to it the way it usually does. And then on the right side of the screen, brainstorm one thing you can do about the problem on the left. And notice how, as you just formulate a possible plan for dealing with it, the problem may seem less stressful and overwhelming. Now take a few moments to reflect on what this means to you in a private sense, and then bring yourself out of the state of self-hypnosis by counting backwards from three to one. On three, get ready. On two, with your eyelids closed, roll up your eyes. One, let your eyes open. Ready? Three, two, one. Okay, I hope you're all back with me. Um, and I hope this has been a useful illustration of how quickly and easily we can tap this ability to control mind and body. There's plenty of evidence now um, that states like hypnosis can be very effective in reducing or even eliminating pain. I can show you some examples of that. Um, and it's an underutilized resource, particularly in this era where we lost 100,000 Americans to overdose deaths, about two thirds of them opioid related. Um, you can't overdose on hypnosis, you can't overdose on acupuncture. So we're underutilizing safe and effective resources. And let me show you some examples of that. Uh, here you may know, in case it wasn't clear how much the reaction to a stimulus is related to pain, you can see the baby looks kind of interested in the vaccination. I'm glad to say he's getting his vaccination. And the father is the one who's in pain. 
Uh, indeed, there are descending inhibitory as well as ascending pathways through the lateral spinothalamic tract, the periactic aqueductal gradient, somatosensory cortex. So the brain has an ability to suppress pain perception from the body. Um, and this is illustrated by this EEG study we did in which we took a group of Stanford students um, and hypnotized them. Told at First, we uh, just uh, gave them a series of shocks to the wrist, like an electric shock. Um, and uh, notice th this is the normal uh, somatosensory ERP to the series of shocks, P1, P2, P300. The yellow line is same subjects hypnotized and told their hand is in ice water, same shocks. And what you see is that the P100 disappears and the P200 and the P300 are only half as big. So within 100 milliseconds of the stimulus, the brain is reacting differently to the stimuli. So pain is not simply the sum of input from the periphery, it is also the way the brain processes and reacts to it. And people can very quickly learn to modulate their pain perception. This is uh, from a study done at the University of Montreal uh, in which the words used in hypnosis to help reduce pain changed the part of the brain that was involved. So if you told them, as we did in the previous experiment, cool tingling numbness, you got reduction in pain, hypnotic analgesia, the main reduction was here in somatosensory cortex. Um, however, if you just said something different to them in hypnosis, you said, well, the pain is there, but it won't bother you very much. Don't feel threatened by it. And we know that many of our cancer patients find any indication of pain, a possible indication of spread of disease, which makes them extremely anxious and makes them pay more attention to the pain. So here we just said it's there, but it won't bother you. We got analgesia, but now, the difference was in the dorsal anterior cingulate cortex in the salience network. So we can trigger changes in activity in different parts of the brain just by changing the language we use. Uh, this is another way I don't recommend as much. He's saying we treat a headache by diverting your attention to something else. We have better ways of doing it. Um, this is a randomized clinical trial we published in The Lancet. It involved percutaneous um, uh, threading of a, a catheter into the artery. Um, to uh, visualize, to, to do chemoembolization in the liver or visualize renal artery stenosis. And we had 241 patients randomized into three conditions. Standard treatment, which involves pressing a button to get opioids IV, uh, that plus structured attention from a sympathetic nurse or hypnotic relaxation and uh, analgesia as we discussed. And here you see um, over the course of three hours, the difference in pain all of them had, had access to opioid analgesia. The hypnosis group used only half as much opioids. And by the end of an hour, two and a half hours, their average pain levels was one, were one out of 10. The average pain levels uh, for the standard care group were four out of 10. And it was about three out of 10 for the, one who got, for the ones who got supportive care. The anxiety difference was even greater. Anxiety levels were five after two and a half hours in the standard care group and zero in the hypnosis group. I was afraid they died or something because they were just so relaxed and comfortable. Um, so the hypnosis group used half as much pain medication as the standard care group. Um, the procedures, you'll notice this line was shorter, got done 17 minutes quicker because the stress was less for the patients but also for the treatment team because the patients were more comfortable. Um, and there were fewer complications by far in the hypnosis group. So you can get more pain relief, more anxiety relief with fewer complications and in less time using hypnosis. Does this work for cancer patients and in the long run, not just in an acute care setting? Yes, it does. This is from a randomized clinical trial uh, where we uh, randomized women with metastatic breast cancer to a weekly support group that included uh, uh, discussion of fears of dying and death, reordering life priorities, helping one another through the disease and training in self-hypnosis for pain control and by the end of a year, the treatment group had half the pain the control group did on the same and very low amounts of analgesic medication. And we replicated that finding 10 years later in another sample and got basically the same result, significantly less pain in the treatment group than the control group. Hypnosis has been used now uh, for breast biopsy and even for lumpectomy as an effective al analgesic alternative uh, uh, while the procedures were being done. 
we're trying now to disseminate this, and um, we have uh, developed uh, uh, an, an interactive hypnosis app uh, called Reverie. It can help people with pain, stress, anxiety, insomnia. It's very helpful for that, smoking cessation. And so you can download the Reverie app by going to the App Store and just uh, type in Reverie and you can get it. And you can take your choice of one of these interventions. The stress intervention, which is like the one that you saw here, uh, um, is one where we got about a 35% reduction pre to post in 15 minutes. So you don't have to wait a long time. These interventions, if they're going to work, can happen very quickly. And you can immediately tell whether it's likely to help you or not. And we just completed a study um, with a very large sample, 15,911 people who were using the app for stress. And we got an effect size of 1.0, which is a very large effect size in reducing pain pre to post within 15 minutes. It's not, it doesn't take a long time to do it. And it's something that when they repeated it, they could do again to the same magnitude. So it can be very helpful in reducing stress. Uh, we've translated it to Spanish, and the Spanish users got the same 35% reduction in stress within 15 minutes uh, that we got in English. We have a pain relief app in which we give people alternatives uh, of um, changing, using a sense of tingling, numbness, uh, going to a different place, dissociating, just imagining you're somewhere else, having a sense of compassion for your body, because many patients get angry with their bodies for the pain and fear that the body seem to inflict on them. And we ask them to think of their bodies as if their body were their child. If your child were sick uh, or in pain, you would never get as frustrated with the child as we do with our own bodies. So taking that point of view can help reduce the stress and the pain or imagining they can move the pain around. And we get um, uh, average reduction at three months from five out of 10 for pain uh, to 3.3 out of 10. So again, um, this is a this is a longer term follow up that showed that that people can get consistent effective analgesia just using self hypnosis um, and patients would say I just want to stay here I feel so relaxed it guides you through a relaxed state that otherwise you wouldn't be able to do for yourself. We also use it to help people stop smoking and we found in one study with 50 users that 19 of them stopped smoking after learning a self-hypnosis exercise that involved telling themselves to focus on respecting and protecting their body as if their body were a child. For my body, smoking is a poison. I need my body to live. I owe my body respect and protection. Um, and uh, some did it with just one use of the app. Some used it daily for a week or more and were able to stop. Um, and among those who didn't stop, there was an average of four cigarettes per day reduction, although cessation is really what the goal needs to be. We've gotten some attention from the Wall Street Journal, New York Times, and other sites that point out that this is an opportunity to use the internet to widely disseminate opportunities to, to use their minds to help their bodies. And one of our subjects, I love this quote, said, this is some crazy ass voodoo shit, and I mean that in a good way. She had no expectation of quitting. She'd been smoking for 25 years, and she surprised herself by stopping. She's now helping her friends to do it by referring them. And we find the users return to use the app at least three to five times um, in, in reinforcing what they do. We've enrolled 120,000 people now, uh, people from 109 countries around the world. So uh, we welcome people. There's no cost to it. We welcome people logging on and seeing what they can do to help themselves with hypnosis. We've also published a textbook with my late father, Herbert Spiegel, Trance and Treatment, uh, that goes in detail about how we use this. I'll mention very briefly before I stop that mindfulness is also a very effective tool. It's used in a different way, not so much to solve a problem as to just concentrate on open presence, uh, scanning your body and having compassion for your body. So many similar principles, uh, very good studies by Richie Davidson at University of Wisconsin have shown increased act frontal activity. And what has also been seen is decreased activity in the posterior cingulate, the default mode. So you become less aware of yourself, which is what happens in the default mode, and more able to just process experience rather than process the implications of it. And there's even studies that show that experienced meditators may have more gray matter as they age, which is something we can all hope for. I want to thank our uh, research funders, the National Cancer Institute, National Institute on Aging, the National Center for Complementary and Integrative Health, 
National Institute of Mental Health, California Breast Cancer Research Program, the Dana Foundation, and the MacArthur Foundation, among others. He's saying I was close to a breakthrough here when the grant money went out. We have a Center for Integrative Medicine at Stanford that's been open since 1998, but we all have problems still in implementing this kind of care. He's saying, I'm sorry, Mr. McConnell, your insurance plan only provides for empathetic nodding and a sad and downward glance. There's a $200 copay for any additional words of compassion, not to exceed 40 words or three expressions of sympathy or condolence. I hope we can get beyond this and help our patients to mind their bodies. Thank you for your attention.